I'd like to introduce you to this wonderful, tiny, full grand sonnery clock with quarter repeat. It's the smallest full grand sonnery clock with quarter repeat I've ever seen, and it's a little gem. To pack in all that mechanism, which goes for eight days, and get it all into this small case is the work of a master clockmaker. Jonathan Puller was probably born about 1662. He finished his apprenticeship in September 1683, and this little clock was probably made in 1685. There are several clocks known by him, and even watches, bracket clock, and a month going long case clock. But this is certainly a beautiful little gem. So just to recap a few of the points on a grand sonnery clock, that a grand sonnery clock known it not only chimes the quarters with a bing, bing, ping for half past, bing, ping, ping for three quarters, and four pings, bing, ping, ping, ping on the hour. Um, but on the quarter, it also strikes the hour. On the half hour, it also strikes the hour. On the three quarters, it strikes the hour. And then, of course, it strikes the next hour. So that's an awful lot of bings and bongs. In eight days, it requires 1,860 bings to do all the quarters. And the hour striking is about 2.6 times the number of the quarter strikes. It comes to 4,992 strikes. And that's an awful lot of energy to get out of a spring. And yet, this energy is in this tiny little clock. So if I move the hand forward to the hour, it will then strike four bings for the fourth quarter for the hour. And it'll be four o'clock, so it'll do four bongs as well. Very confusing. Four o'clock. But as I explained, when we come to quarter past four, it will do one bing and four bongs. One for quarter past and then four for the hour. Here we go. One quarter. So every quarter of an hour, it tells you the exact time. The bing for the quarters and the bong for the hours. So that it rings throughout the house to tell everybody exact time every quarter of an hour. So it's a lovely low caddy top with a neat little handle on top, a cast fret here, two cast escutcheons, and they're slightly heavier than the nib ones, not quite as beautiful, but what's very interesting is they've got two faces, one each side. Each escutcheon has got a keyhole in it, so instead of like nib, it's cut in, this one has it cast in, and you've got two little faces each side doesn't look as pretty though when, when you've got an extra one on the style with the hinge, does it? So, open the door and have a closer look at the features. Lovely, lovely small spandrels. Clear engraving on the dial here and beautiful pair of tiny, tiny little hands. And the whole thing is just a beautiful little gem. The sound fret has lost whatever was in there, but uh, you've got the, the cast sound fret on the outside of the door here. It's a real achievement to manufacture a full quarter repeat grand sonnery clock on this scale. But even he squeezed in a calendar look as well, so that he really was a master clockmaker, although not very much is known about him, and there are very few clocks survived by him. I'm always very nervous to pick up a clock on a handle like this. You're relying on 350-year-old fish glue, so I always try and pick it up from the bottom. 
and then turn it round. Nothing is more embarrassing than ending up with just a handle in your hand. Opening the back, and what a beautiful back it is. The quality of the engraving and the swirls and the floral decoration, it all blends into um, a holistic design as well as being individual, very interesting flowers and swirls. You can see the two quarter repeater levers coming out with the, the two pulls so that uh, you can have a his and hers in between your bed at night so that you can pull the cord and both of them operate in the same way and when you release it bing quarter past bong 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 quarter past four in the morning so you know within a quarter of an hour what the time is every time you pull the, the lever.